Welcome to a special edition of Santa Barbara Talks with Josh Molina. And I want to just turn the floor over to the individual who's our guest today, Goleta City Councilman James Cariaco. You have a big announcement, James. So why don't we just start there? Let's talk about what's going on. Thank you, Josh. And thanks for uh, thanks for letting me join you on this Sunday morning. Uh, my announcement is um, I am going to be seeking re-election to the Goleta City Council. And I'm doing that because I want to continue my efforts to bring uh, many years of, of local leadership experience uh, in the nonprofit sector and uh, here in local government at both the city and county level uh, to keep Galita a healthy, safe, uh, and fiscally sound city. Wow, James, that's pretty big news. I know that you have been an activist for so long. You've been an elected official. And You've been a consultant way back when. You've been very involved in public service. This has been your life. Why are you running again for this position? Specifically, what are the issues in Goleta that you want to continue to have an impact on? Well, I want to continue my work uh, to pri prioritize protecting our environment, um, providing resources for children and youth, uh, for working families, uh, and continue my efforts to keep um, Galita moving on the path to being more responsive uh, to community input. Uh, you know, I have local roots. I know the history of our community backwards and forward. It really helps me um, to, to understand where the community is coming from on a lot of really complex issues and allows me to bring that um, experience and, uh, and know-how as, as well as local and regional relationships um, to solve problems effectively. Now, James, I cover you, you know, I just watch you on the Glitter City Council, I write some stories, I'm familiar with your work. For people who are voting for the first time in November, who are just getting involved in politics, can you talk about your accomplishments? I mean, why should somebody give you a second term? A lot of times, people or not even a second term, but another term, a lot of people say, well, you say you're going to do all these things, but you're an incumbent. Why haven't you done them already? Talk about what you've done while on the Goleta City Council. Sure. Well, uh, over the last four years, um, we've had to be um, to be nimble and agile and respond to things that have happened, you know, not just locally, but also regionally, uh, statewide and nationally. For example, COVID-19. Um, you know, I was able to help lead efforts to adopt a COVID economic recovery plan. Uh, as a result of that, the city has come out of COVID in a, in a strong position economically. We didn't have to lay off employees. Um, businesses have largely been able to stay open and we're getting some new businesses. Uh, other employers are adding jobs, um, been able to increase funding that's been dedicated to, uh, to protecting public safety. Uh, Goleta continues to consistently be uh, voted one of uh, California's 50 safest cities. Um, we've initiated policies making childcare more accessible for working families. That's an issue that doesn't get a lot of ink or a lot of attention, but I think it's really important uh, to the role of local government to try and help facilitate conditions where you can make uh, childcare access more affordable. You can't have a local workforce uh, that is diverse and vital if your employees have to worry about what's happening with their children. And if they can't put their children in a place that's safe and has high quality and close to where they live and work. And so um, in particular, I led on that issue. We passed a child care zoning ordinance. We um, reduced the, the number of zones in the city that have really restrictive rules that prevent child care from being, being added. And uh, now we're hearing about local businesses and local specific plans that are being generated that will be adding child care um, because of those efforts. Uh, I'm also really uh, proud that we voted to, to hire a new Spanish engagement specialist to perform uh, needed community outreach. That came in, in particular really handy when we started wrestling with the issue of what to do about Old Town and the Hollister Corridor, being able to hear um, from businesses that didn't traditionally get heard from. Um, I'm also really proud um, that I partnered with one of my colleagues to form a new diversity, equity, and inclusion committee for the city council. Um, we hired a position uh, that has a DEI specialist, and we also voted to uh, join Central Coast Community Energy to help us meet our fossil-free uh, by 2030 goals. And so those are some, some things I'm really proud of 
that affect the whole city. Uh, but I want to talk in particular about something that affects uh, the neighborhood where I live, which is Old Town Goleta. So the city council in Goleta, we voted to go to um, district elections and we just adopted new districts. And so I'm in district two, which is essentially everything from uh, Goleta Valley Cottage Hospital, where I'm a board member, um, all the way through the mobile home parks and the businesses on Ward Memorial, the agriculture block over there, Samita Gardens Apartments, into Old Town, Old Town proper, um, you know, on the other side of the 217. So all of Old Town, uh, the areas along Arrow Camino, kind of that business district that's over there, moving along to Cabrillo Business Park and, um, you know, the, re the, the research parks where a lot of our high tech businesses are. And then uh, right along to Target, which I'm so proud to say we were able to bring uh, to the city of Goleta through a lot of hard work um, in the last four years. Um, allowing us to move from Kmart, which was a top 10 sales tax producer for the city of Goleta, to Target, which is a top five sales tax provider. And so I basically have all of those areas uh, in my district. And so for that area, I'm really proud in particular that we delivered a new park, Johnny Wallace Park in Old Town. Uh, we have a new community garden that's going to be going in at our Meadows Park. Um, I worked with uh, council with um, Congress member. Um, Salud Carbajal to secure $3 million for the Goleta Community Center renovation. We added a new sports field and pickleball courts in Old Town. Um, we improved the environmental review for the Goleta train depot. Um, and we voted to purchase City Hall, which is also in my district. And that's saving over $100,000 annually because rather than paying rent, we're basically we're investing that money back in ourselves. And so I'm really proud of all those things that are specific to my district. I was at Johnny Wallace Park yesterday and just kind of marveling again at all of the opportunities for play there. It's not one, it's several different recreational paths and it just looking at all the people in the community and that park while I was there really reflected what Old Town Goleta looks like, um, which is exactly the goal, which is to offer services to people who live there and obviously people like me who live closer to target can also go check it out because uh you know we don't have anything like that in other parts of the city so that was a real big deal for for Galita to be able to pull off for sure it's a really special place it's a, a you know it's not a huge massive park like Birch park but it really punches above its weight it's got everything from a skate park to handball courts to a ba basketball hoops pickleball court it's got a place for people to eat and recreate there's little tables where you can play chess ping pong tables and you've got that big field where you always see people playing soccer it's just it's got something for everybody <laughs> really special place yes and then of course you should get reelected probably just off of target being in town because there's a lot of people happy about that for sure <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad it was able to finally get done. James, let me ask you a question here. I, I know that you uh, want, want to talk about your announcement. And so let, let, me, let me just ask you something specific. You mentioned childcare and why that's so important to you. Can you just explain for a minute or two why that issue is significant to you in a way that is more than maybe just some of the other things that someone running for office will want to focus on to get votes or to let people know they care about. You always talk about childcare in a way that is really deeply personal. And it's something that you've been working on. People may not know. This is not an opportunistic effort by you. Uh, this is something that you've been working on way back when with Roger Councilman Roger Horton back in the day as a consultant. So can you just spend a couple of minutes on why this issue resonates so strongly with you? Well, it's it's really personal because I, I grew up needing it. So um, just a little bit about me. So four generations of my family have lived, worked, and served um, the Glita and Santa Barbara communities. My, my mother's family uh, started a su successful small business, Turnbull Florists, uh, in Santa Barbara. Uh, my grandfather, Andy Cariaco, and his family uh, spent their careers helping other local businesses, for example, Giordano's here in Goleta. And so from them, I learned uh, the importance of hard work, uh, listening to diverse perspectives, and really leading from your values. But um, 
but my mom raised me largely on her own. She was a, she was a single, single mom. Uh, my dad uh, went to the army. Uh, he was an army ranger, uh, came back and became an MTD uh, mechanic and then later a paralegal. But, um, but my mom and my dad split up at, when I was fairly young. And so I grew up needing childcare and I had good childcare and not so good childcare. And as I got, as I got older and I started learning more about the issue and learning about uh, the importance of, importance of early childhood education to brain growth, the ability of people to lead um, a successful life, um, it really just uh, impacted me. And so I started volunteering. I became a board member of Santa Barbara Family Care Center, which at the time um, managed a, an infant center and a preschool, Centro Infantil and Centro Familiar. And then uh, that later transformed into what we know today as Santa Barbara County Children's Resource and Referral. But I was working on childcare issues going back to like 2002, 2003. And uh, the need has not lessened during that time. And I, you know, I certainly don't work on the issue because it pulls well, um, but it's important. And it's important both economically and also just from a social justice perspective. So uh, for personal reasons and because, um, you know, I represent a very working class district uh, where people really need access to childcare if they're going to work. Um, you know, you think about um, if someone has to go out of the workforce for a few years and step away from their career, all the retirement savings that they don't get, all the future social security money that they won't get, um, all the promotions they won't get. Um, and we should acknowledge that this mostly affects women. Women are primarily uh, the caregivers. And so um, it's really important from a representation perspective um, that I acknowledge um, and do everything I can with the position that I'm entrusted with um, to support people, um, you know, even if they're not like me exactly, right? You know, don't have the same experience, lived experience that I have. I have to be a, someone that represents everybody. Yeah. Okay. Uh, a couple of things that I want to ask you about uh, living in Galita, we have these dual needs. Okay. We know the state is putting pressure, rightfully so, on communities to build housing because we are in need of housing for everybody, all levels. And so there are these state mandates to do that. So housing is good, we realize that. At the same time, if you've lived in Galita a long time and if you've lived in these communities, you know that traffic uh, has increased, congestion has increased, uh, you know, we've got, members of the council who ran on that issue a few years ago and said we need to slop, slow down the, the rapid growth. If you've ever been at Stork and Hollister and you were around before all that housing, you know it's it's a few minutes delay, congestion. I mean, I can't even tell you how many lights there are on Hollister between Stork and the, you know, the, the shopping center there, three, four, a little bit past Camino Real. You know, it's significant. And of course, these are issues of, we're not LA. Yes, we know that. We know that it's still a great place to live. But can you talk about what is the future of housing in Goleta? And how does that translate to what people who live here feel about increased sort of presence of traffic and congestion? Yeah. So um, I think the the answer on housing is there's not going to be one solution. There's going to be several. And if we do everything right with those solutions, we're not going to solve the problem, but we'll mitigate it a little bit. You can really only do things around the, the edges because we live on a narrow coastal plain between the mountains and the ocean. And there's only so much uh, open buildable space. Um, so we're, we're not going to be able to do a lot more. Now, in the last decade, Goleta built over 1,300 units of housing, and that basically constituted um, what's known as RENA, the Regional Housing Needs Assessment Cycle. That was basically two RENA cycles worth of housing in Goleta. And just because of recessions in the past and the cost of materials, uh, the timing of things, um, a lot of the housing just got built during that time. Um, Hollister Village got built during that time. Uh, Cortona Point is just finishing now, but was approved, I think, in 2014. So there's been a lot of building in Goleta in the last several years, which is just starting to wrap up now. 
but that's largely projects that were approved in the past. So the future of Goleta is really going to be about being thoughtful and really careful with our planning. Um, we have, we have a, a potential project coming in the near future um, called Heritage Ridge. That would be 332 units of new housing, over 30% uh, of which would be affordable if the project is approved. And when I say affordable, you know, sometimes you, you hear politicians say affordable housing, and then you find out what the incomes are of the people. And it's like, well, those are really high incomes, you know, and, and so they call the income categories, you know, moderate and above moderate. The 30% affordable housing that would be happening at Heritage Ridge, if it's eventually approved, would be for low and very low income folks, people that are making 50% of the average median income, not big, not big money. So the people that that work locally, that are working class folks, um, but haven't been able to get into nicer housing, they're living in substandard housing, this would create opportunities for them to move up into something a little bit better and not have to pay a whole lot more than they're already paying for rent or maybe even paying less for rent. Um, and it would also allow a lot of our local workforce that's having to commute from Lompoc, from Ventura, from uh, other places, to live and to live in the place where they work. So that would potentially be a really big um, dent in our remaining housing problems. But you have to go through the process. There are environmental concerns related to that project and we're waiting to see how that project is going to be resolved. It still has to get through the planning commission. And my understanding is the project um, still probably has a little bit of a ways to go to get through the planning commission. Yeah. Um, after that, it's really about um, where can we find opportunities where we can? Um, can we do a little bit of mixed use and can we do a little bit of adaptive reuse? Um, we're gonna have to be really strategic. Um, the housing element process is coming up. And so that will really be the venue where we'll decide as a community, what's the best way to address our, our housing challenges and we'll do it together. Great. Uh, just one more thing, James. It's not really a local local issue, but I mean jurisdictionally. Um, but it is a local issue, and just in terms of the impact and the amount of people who, who are going to be affected uh, by what could come this week. And so I wanted to talk to you. Obviously, we had the news break in May about uh, Roe versus Wade and the Supreme Court preliminary opinion that Politico broke. And uh, there was a wave of protests and it kind of, um, you know, sort of uh, <clears throat> a little bit just sort of diminished in terms of the activism, but it's going to come back real big here in terms of the announcement that is pending. I know that this issue is also an issue of concern to you. Uh, it's important to you. You've been outspoken. You've talked about this issue publicly. So before we wrap up here, can you just talk a little bit about this Roe versus Wade uh, potential reversal that might happen and uh, what that means to you as somebody who, yes, you are a Galita Council member and you are running for re-election. And so it's not something you you know, specifically uh, control but it's still important to you and probably important to the people who are deciding whether to vote for you in terms of your value. So can you talk about this issue and what this means to you? Absolutely. So I don't know if it's going to happen tomorrow on Monday or if it's going to happen on Wednesday, but perhaps the most consequential public policy decision of not just my lifetime, but probably your lifetime too, um, will likely happen, the overturning of Roe versus Wade. And it's, uh, it's, it's incredibly disappointing. I think it's, it's evidence that elections have consequences and that people need to be really, really thoughtful when they make decisions about who they're gonna vote for um, in elected office, uh, not just at the level of who's running for president, uh, but who's running for city council who's running for your local school board, who's running for your superintendent of schools, right? Because the people that are your elected officials today in your local community can be your future state legislator tomorrow, your future Congress member tomorrow, your future Supreme Court justice 
a few tomorrows down the road. So elections have consequences. All elections have consequences, including the local ones. But for my, my constituents, you know, this is something where um, we feel it really, really close to home. You know, in California, we've had uh, reproductive freedom going back to before the Rose decision because we, we've had it passed at the state level. But for, I think, something like a third of our country, at, with the snap of the fingers and the dropping of an opinion, a lot of fundamental rights uh, for people who can become pregnant are going to just disappear, like at the snap at the snap of a finger. And so it's just, I, I think we have to just acknowledge that this is going to be a really traumatic thing for a lot of people. Um, your your viewers, your your listeners, uh, tomorrow, Wednesday, Thursday. They might be in a daze, they might be in a fog, um, incredibly upset and edgy and agitated. Um, you may find people just suddenly bursting out into tears, seemingly for no reason, because they're carrying with them an emotional load of what the impact of this means for their children, their grandchildren, uh, for themselves. Um, it's a really, it, it's it's a really emotional time for a lot of people, and I'm and I know there's other people that are probably, you know, feeling justified and vindicated, and you know, people get to have their opinions in this country, but um, I'm really feeling for the people whose fundamental rights are about to be um, eroded uh, throughout this country. Okay, well, yeah, th thank you for that. I know you've been talking about that issue for for years and uh reproductive rights and you know it's as sub a journalist have been around for a while you know 20 years or so um i know the ones who are putting in the work and have been talking about these issues for decades and then the ones who just kind of show up during election time and talk about them and i know this issue is super super important to you let me just give you the it's last word James. if i could just say also it, it's personal in this household um you know, my wife worked for Planned Parenthood locally for well over a decade. Um, in Goleta, you know, I worked with the mayor to pass a resolution affirming reproductive freedom after uh, the Texas decision, SB8. Um, this is incredibly personal um, in this household and for um, a, lot of, a lot of our friends and um, a lot of our community members. So it's, um, it's scary. Okay, I want to give you the final word here, James. Um, just kind of go over the nuts and bolts. You're running for re-election. Tell us again the district, the date, and what people yeah. need to know about yeah. you before we sign off. Yeah. So uh, the, again, the district, um, the district is basically everything south of the 101 freeway from Patterson all the way to Hollister and Stork. Um, everything south of the 101, with the exception of Stork Ranch. Um, is in, in my district, starting from Patterson all the way to Stork. Um, and, you know, I guess what I would say is that um, local experience matters, uh, local relationships matter. Uh, having put in the time and, and having the record is why I'm, I'm so proud that even though I'm really just getting my campaign started today, I'm already uh, endorsed by, you know, federal, state, and local leaders, environmental leaders, uh, labor leaders, uh, taxpayer advocates. I'm supported by our mayor, Glita, Mayor Paula Prodi, uh, Glita Council members, Kyle Richards and Stuart Kasdan, our Congress member, Salud Carbajal, our state senator, Monique Limon, our former state senator, Hannah Beth Jackson, uh, supervisors, Joan Hartman, Greg Hart, Doss Williams, and our future supervisor, Laura Capps, um, Glita school board members, Sholay Jahangir and Vicky Chenyakov, uh, and so many um, other local elected officials, but I just want to highlight a couple other people. Um, former city fire chief Pat McElroy, um, Lanny Ebenstein, who's a good government advocate and taxpayer advocate, uh, local environmental attorney Linda Kropp, uh, child care advocate Eileen Monahan, uh, child care advocate Lori Lander Goodman. I have a really diverse um, array of supporters, people that don't always agree on every issue, but they agree that that my my vision for really uniting our community around a certain set of values and principles um, 
is something that they can get behind. So I'm really proud to have those early endorsements. And I've already raised about $20,000. Great. Yeah, that's, that's great. And I think you highlighted too, and we saw this in the June primary, uh, the time to run does not start a year before the election. You know, the time to run is when you're just a person in the community and you need to do work and do it for you for, for the authentic reasons of serving. And those who just seek to run because there's an opportunity aren't going to find a whole lot of success, in my opinion, and, and observations over the years, because it's about the relationships you have to put in, even if it means you lose once or twice, eventually people are like this, this person's for real. And, um, you know, you've been doing that for for a long time. So uh, looking forward to seeing your campaign and just sort of watching all of that play out and seeing what's going to come in Goleta, um, you know, this year going forward. Down the road, James, we'll talk about Old Town. We'll talk about parking, angled parking, all that stuff. You know that I, I have some uh, thoughts on, but um, that's for another day. So thanks a lot, James. Appreciate your time and good luck with everything. Thank you.